Happy Monday, Niner fans. How we doing? We are less than two weeks away from the NFL draft, and I'm joined on Monday with my right-hand man, Big Ted from TED Talks Ball. Uh, and we have a very special guest today, John Pay. I'm going to let them both introduce themselves. First and foremost, Ted, how are we feeling? Doing great. Uh, had, had a nice bike ride this morning and uh, feeling refreshed and uh, super excited to uh, chop it up today and learn a little bit more. We got a couple special announcements from John Pay, and uh, so I'm excited to share that with everybody. Definitely. So, John, tell us all about a former 49er, former Stanford legend, Stanford Hall of Famer in, in, in football and basketball. You tell us about yourself more than I could tell you. A I will, well, first off, yes, I, I sell real estate now, and I was just in beautiful Capitola. Okay. Um, very beautiful out there selling or looking at property on Opal Drive, which is right next to uh, Pleasure Point. Um, and uh, very inspired by that. But now back home, uh, excited about doing this uh, uh, podcast with you guys. But anyway, yes, I'm uh, Stanford through and through. I was born at Stanford Hospital, and I've never lived more than um, six miles from campus. And uh, played all my sports here. I played, uh, uh, high, I played Pop Warner football in Menlo Park right next to Stanford. We always beat the Palo Alto Pop Warner team, though. That was the Palo Alto Knights. Um, and then uh, I played uh, local high school football, basketball, and baseball at Menlo School, which is a prep school um, in Atherton, and then migrated to Stanford on a Stanford, bas or Stanford football scholarship, and then also played for the basketball team there. And then uh, I also uh, was drafted by the San Francisco uh, Giants in baseball, and then got to play for the 49ers at Coach Walsh, and I'm proud owner of this um, – Super Bowl 23 ring, and I'm happy to be with, here with you guys today. Very good, very good. Super Bowl champion over here. So what was it like playing in the NFL back in those days? Well, it was you know, kind of interesting. The landscape of uh, making it to college and pro football was different back in the uh, 70s and 80s when I was growing up. Um, you know, The big thing that we did, uh, or at least I did, I went to Stanford football camps that were uh, hosted and run by the coaching staff at Stanford. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I got to be there uh, uh, as a camper back in the 70s when Bill Walsh was the coach at Stanford. So I started learning the Bill Walsh offense at that camp way back in, uh, you know, 1976. So I learned, uh, you know, red, right, 22 ZN. Uh, I also learned uh, uh, red, right, zoom motion, 20 halfback curl that uh, – uh, was used in Super Bowl 23 when Montana threw it to John Taylor against the Bengals. Um, so, uh, God, I've had a very uh, fortunate um, athletic career uh, being right here, um, right here at Stanford, uh, in the Stanford community. Bay Area, it's like a, you're a Bay Area legend. You've been here, like you said, Stanford through and through. That's awesome. Man. That is amazing stuff. Ted, um, tell me a little bit more about, um, you know, how you know, uh, my man John over here. Yeah, we met at a Super Bowl party, and I can vouch for him calling out the plays. He was telling me all the formations and everything going on, and uh, it was really exciting. And I just said, hey, John, uh, I do a, a live stream show on YouTube, and would love to have you on sometime. And uh, we found a way to make it happen today, so uh, super excited about that. Uh, it was great uh, sitting during the Super Bowl, other than the ending, obviously. Uh, it was a little disappointing, but I remember John saying a lot during the game, like, hey, got to score, got to score, got to score, when we kept uh, petering out on our drives. And uh, that was prophetic words there by John, for sure. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of jump in there, uh, talking about you know differences between uh, today and yesteryear. And uh, when I played for the 49ers, uh, there was no remote uh, microphone into the helmet of the quarterbacks. We actually signaled in the plays. Oh yeah! And uh, during Super Bowl Twenty Three, I was the third string quarterback. So my important job was to block the hand signals that Steve Young was giving to Joe Montana to do the plays. Coach Walsh would call the play to Steve. Steve would signal it in, and then I had to stand between Steve and Sam Weiss, who was the head coach of the Bengals at the time. And Sam was the previously the quarterback coach for the 49ers for Super Bowl 16. And he was the one that uh, um, 
came up with the handsomeness. So he could have stolen our signs. Oh, um, man. So I have one of the most important jobs at Super Bowl 23. And uh, also it was kind of funny is that I could, you know, later on after I retired uh, with my fourth shoulder operation, um, I used to go to the 49 games and I could call out the plays in the stands based on watching the hand signal from oh, wow. Steve Young. And so I'd be in the stands and I'd go, hey, I bet this is going to be a sweep to the right to Roger Craig. And these fans, they just thought I was like maybe had too much to drink. But then they figured out after the third, fourth, fifth exact call, like, hey, how do you know what's going on? <laughs> so that was kind of humorous to play with uh, the minds of some of my uh, fellow spectators that I was watching the, the, the games. At. But, yeah, I'm a 49 fan through and through. Football was always my favorite sport. Uh, the first quarterback I remember – um, watching for the 49ers was uh, Joe uh, uh, John Brody, and he used to throw the ball to number 18. At the time, that was Gene Washington, and I always played out in the streets. Uh, I was always – I was first a, a wide receiver, so I wanted to be five receivers, and then I graduated to quarterback. Um, I started playing Pop Warner football for the Menlo Atherton Vikings Pop Warner program. Wow, that's, that's awesome, and that is – uh, pretty crazy how things have changed, you know, from, like you said, yesterday year to now. I mean, and just in the game itself, you know, players, the way they look and everything. And then something else that's kind of come up lately is is how social media has changed the game. Like, we're sitting here talking about players go on, they have their podcast. So uh, you said you're a fan of the team. You probably keep up with all the, uh, you know, latest uh, news and stuff. So free agency nowadays, way different than it was back in your day, right? So I don't know, I don't know how much you know about, like, Brandon Ayuk's situation, right? I know he's and I unfollow the team on social media and all this stuff. And there's like leverage techniques and, you know, there's all these different strategies these players use to get their money. But what's your take on the whole Brennan Ayuk situation? Cause yeah, he's kind of making an uproar on social media, kind of like Debo did a few years ago. And how was it back then when you were trying to get, you know, in, in free agency and, and getting contracts back then? Right. It was a lot easier uh, to maintain a team uh, because there was no salary cap. Uh, and uh, we had a owner at the time, Eddie DeBarlo, that was uh, very, very player friendly, and uh, he would throw a lot of money at his uh, at roster, uh, and that's how we were able to afford like two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, Steve Young and Joe Montana. You couldn't do that in today's world. Uh, now the 49ers are fortunate, uh, you know, this year, and I think there's probably going to be maybe a restructure uh, sometime in the next 12 months with Brock Purdy. Uh, but we have a quarterback that's relatively inexpensive, and that allows us uh, to sign all of these, you know, star players that we have. Of which uh, Brandon Ayuk, um, I, I, I'm not privy to the, uh, you know, the exact cap dollars and everything that they have. But you know, if a team is able to sign a player um, and uh, do some maneuverings, God, the 49ers should be able to with that you know, inexpensive quarterback uh, tag on or price tag on uh, on Brock. Yeah, definitely. Ted, what's your take on on the whole situation? I know you've been keeping up with it with me, but um, I guess this week, you know, we saw the whole Ayuk fiasco kind of unravel a little bit more. Where it was reported that he asked for a trade, and then he came out, and his agent came out and denied it. I mean, I think it's all just right out of Debo's playbook from when Debo who did his mm -hmm. negotiations. I think he, he probably got his advice from Debo and he's following it to the T. I mean, my opinion on it is the same as when we talked before it all started unraveling, Raj. I mean, we, we thought it was going to get a little crazy, but we think Brandon wants to be here. We think that the Niners want to sign Brandon. I have nothing, nothing leads me to believe that anything's changed since then. Yeah, I agree. Ultimately, I, I agree with what John said is, you know, since they have this quarterback, you know, where he can, they could save some money right now with the quarterback that's not getting paid compared to what the market is. They're going to be able to restructure and make some moves. But then the the problem is when they actually have to pay Brock Purdy, that's when things are really going to get dicey. So I think they'll be able to figure out the IU situation. But, of course, everybody on social media wants to jump the gun and make a report. And that's the thing is now we have all these reports. We don't even know because, you know, even 20 years ago, I was talking about how you didn't have social media like this. And, and there are stories breaking out every second. There could be a story breaking out right now while we're talking you know, back then it was the only time you really see stuff on the media is when you go turn on Sports Center, you know, prime time and the rest of the day. But other than that, you're not like getting news at the at your fingertips at every hour of the day. And, and people like me and you, you know, John Smith down the street wants to be a sports writer now and they can 
create a channel and talk about sports and act like an insider. So it's definitely crazy how things have changed. Um, speaking of times changing too. So the other thing I want to kind of ask John about this because quarterback controversy you must have been right in the heart of the biggest quarterback controversy of all time pretty much but the 49ers have always had these quarterback issues finally it seems like there's no drama it's been nice and refreshing this offseason having you know a franchise quarterback Brock Purdy's the guy we know he's you know the starter there's no issues but let's dial it back to back in those days you were there you know the quarterback there with Joe Montana and Steve Young how was it (laughs) being in that quarterback room Right. Well, I think what uh, Coach Walsh, uh, the type of culture that he wanted to breed was one that was cohesive, but also competitive amongst the, our fellow athletes. So he, um, in my opinion, as a uh, you know, 22, 23 year old quarterback watching how he was doing it and now looking back on it, I think he kind of wanted to generate competition between Steve and Joe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know you know, both Steve and Joe would complain to me about how many reps each of them were getting. I was, I was like, Hey, I'm getting no, no reps, but <laughs> um, uh, they would split reps in practice, which is kind of unheard of. Usually you give the uh, starting quarterback at least 80%. You know, some teams I think I've heard were like uh, Brady would get a hundred percent of the snaps in practice, but uh, they split that time. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, coach Walsh believed in, competition. And I think, um, you know, and then sometimes he would, So, and, and I think Coach Walsh kind of felt secure in his job from some standpoint where he would uh, uh, bring up things in the media about this competition. Sometimes I think coaches shy away from that because that's an easy way to get fired is uh, not playing the right quarterback. But uh, he, you know, he talked a lot. We always had packages in our offensive game plan for Steve to go in to use his running skills and uh yeah god steve i'm pretty certain you know someone could second my um concept but i'm pretty sure steve was the fastest guy on our team Uh he 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 could fly and he had like tremendous acceleration um i I know that uh uh at the combine i I think i pretty remember him you know running a four five three or something um But yeah, he he was. Uh, I would I put my money on on uh, Steve on uh, you know a forty yard dash with anybody on that team. I think that's uh, right. I think it's right about the same as George Kittle. George George Kittle could beat everybody on that team. No 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 no. He was a four five three. Oh, four five three. Okay. Yeah. So, well, uh, yeah. just to put it in perspective, and Kittle is very fast for a tight end, and most tight ends are fast. Oh, good. Kittle's just like a monster. I mean, like yeah. I, I don't know between him and Debo. Like the defenders just bounce off them. They try to tackle them, and it's almost like their bodies just absorb the hit, and they just bounce off, which is just, you know, uh, I, I know that was a big um, – I don't think they use the acronym that they use now, or maybe they do, was uh, the YAC, yards after catch. But that was uh, a staple of Coach Walsh's offense that Shannon had adheres to is get the ball, um, high percentage passes, and then uh, we always talked about uh, – Coach Walsh always talked about throwing the ball one foot in front of the numbers so that the guy could catch it and then turn what is called north and south upfield and gain positive yardage. And uh, you know, I still remember old uh, John Taylor catching those two slant passes against the Rams. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was 96 yards for a touchdown. The other was 94. Yeah. That was the game. That's, those were uh, – you no. Know, uh, when the Rams, uh, Rams and the 49ers were battling uh, there in the 80s. You know, and that's also when, uh, well, a- anyway, yes, we won that ball game. Yeah, it was uh, two big touchdowns in that game. Slant and go, John Taylor. Those, those highlights are, are classic. So you're right. And, and the 49ers, it's pretty much, it's a, it's a dump off pass, short, high percentage pass. And you're right, these guys like Kittle and Debo, they're, able to take big contact and, and keep going, you know? So it's interesting how that uh, play is. And I'm sure, you know, you guys were, were taught that from Walsh. It's it's interesting to see the, the similarities, you know, in Walsh's, uh, you know, design and, and Kyle Shanahan, you know, there, there's a lot of similarities there, obviously versions of the West coast offense there. So um, what was I going to say? So in terms of that, also running back. So tell me a little bit more about like, Roger Craig and what he brought to the table with the 49ers. Cause that guy was, he was basically what CMC is today before he got, and you know, before it got modernized. And 
the other thing is, uh, I don't know why he's not even in the Hall of Fame. This guy was the first like all-purpose dual running back, dual threat running back. Yeah. So um, from today's running game with Coach Walsh and comparing it to, to uh, well, to Shanahan's modern day run game and Coach Walsh. Coach Walsh's running game was a little bit more s- simple. Um, Shanahan has a lot of misdirection, uh, real creative things that uh, went beyond our. I think we had, you know, maybe eight to ten running plays. Um, oh, wow. uh, what Coach Walsh was uh, constantly trying to do was set up, which was called the play pass, which was a fake run that they had shown once, two, three times, and then fake the run throw the pass. Um, uh, but yes, I, I would say the use of a tight end and two backs is really um, valuable uh, long-term for long-term team success. And uh, that was what Coach Walsh used was the uh, 21 personnel, which, as I said, two running backs, one tight end, and uh, uh, playing off those three facets of, of the game. You have your, uh, or you got your run plays, you get your pass plays, and then you have your play passes. And uh, uh, you know, I, I can't think of a better offensive coach uh, than Coach Shanahan. So we're very fortunate to have him now, as well as uh, we're for honest, we're very fortunate to have Coach Walsh uh, calling their plays. Yeah, very, very great coaching lineage overall. But a lot of fans nowadays are kind of sour. Not everybody, but there's a lot of sour fans on on Kyle Shanahan. You know, he hasn't been able to win the big one. What's your take? What, is, what do you think it's going to take for the 49ers to get over the hump this offseason? You know, they've brought back a lot of their players. They've signed some good key, you know, free agents. The draft's coming up. What's your take on all that? Like, what do they need to do to get over the hump? Well, the real take, and I want to be kind of honest with you guys, is, uh, you know, the old adage is uh, offense sells tickets and defense wins uh, championships. So uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, really the heart and soul of our 49ers that won all those Super Bowls uh, and our team leader, um, when I was there, was Ronnie Lott. Right? Mm. Uh, uh, Ronnie was uh, the inspirational player on the team that ran, you know, the team meetings for the most part. He was the most respected player on the team. And uh, what you really need more than anything is in, the, in pro football is putting pressure on the quarterback. And uh, I, I just I, I would point more to the defensive side of the ball of being dominant and uh, getting pressure on the quarterback to win. Because really, uh, Coach Walsh kept talking about the last four minutes of a game. And uh, uh, you need to be able to, on offense, you need to be able to sustain first downs. And uh, you need to do that in the fourth quarter to win. And then on the flip side, if you're on defense, you need to rush the quarterback. So uh, I'm a big believer in uh, all that money the 49ers have given to their uh, defensive line. Uh, Mm -hmm. But... uh, yeah, you can't win if you can't uh, put pressure on that quarterback. And uh, I, I'd really chalk it up on, not, not to point fingers, but um, we needed to have more pressure on that quarterback uh, on those uh, two Super Bowls that uh, the 49ers have lost with uh, Coach Shanahan. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. I feel like that's a, a big, big issue there and, and stopping the run. That D-line, like you said, they've been paid – millions of dollars this is one of the biggest highest paid defensive line and, and they feel like i feel like they haven't lived up to that money so i, I agree with that and um yeah, maybe if you got back ronnie lot maybe that would yeah, help well, maybe you, maybe he could still play i mean he amputated his finger but he could probably still do it i got so you got any crazy stories like that where you know like ronnie lot the finger story is there some crazy what's the craziest thing you remember from from being on uh just, yeah just to sing ronnie lot's praises more um I was on the team in uh, 1987 when um, uh, the NFL went on strike, mm. and uh, and yes, Ronnie was our leader. Uh, when everything kind of got worked out with all the players back in after, um, I think there was three weeks of um, replacement players. I know uh, there's other terms that they use, but uh, the replacement games. Uh, we came back, and I know Coach Walsh was just. He was interested in winning, winning the Super Bowl. And uh, uh, we had won our three replacement games, and we had, like, a good record. And Coach Walsh was going to kind of, like, push everything under the rug and say, hey, let's go forward. Uh, what, is, what has happened has happened. Let's go forward. And really, Ronnie read the room correctly, and it was like, no, Coach Walsh, uh, we need to talk about 
things because there was some animosity within the club on how some players went back, other people players stayed out, and um, and it was something that was necessary. So, so and sometimes you need a leader like that will call things out where he's addressing, you know, everybody like, hey, we need to talk about this. And I remember Coach Walsh feeling like he was losing some control of the, the meeting that we had at the end of our first practice back from the strike. And he was like, oh, someone needs to control Ronnie. Someone needs to, and then and Ronnie just like waved him off. Bill, this used to call, you know, Coach Walsh was like, Bill, you call him by his first name. Bill, we're talking about this. And then we had another 90 minutes talking about it as a team where people really expressed their feelings uh, about kind of how things went down, how some guys came back, some guys didn't. And uh, yeah, Ronnie was the heart and soul of our team that made things think they fixed. So I, again, um, uh, our next Super Bowl, we won with the 49ers will be one on defense. I, I, I think that's a fair, fair point. And, and you need to have a strong leader. I feel like Fred Warner's a pretty good leader, but it sounds like Ronnie was just, he, he brought everybody's, you know, well, everything well, Ronnie's a little bit crazy. I don't know if Ron, I don't know if Warner's crazy. <laughs> enough. <laughs> you gotta yeah, have a little yeah, yeah. You gotta have a little bit of, you gotta be like, Oh, Ronnie's upset. But he's he was just out there, like so. You when he's when he talked, they listened. Arguably the biggest hitter ever, too. I mean, just yeah. And he was crazy. He's from USC. They're crazy. Oh man. USC. Oh well, yeah. Stanford, USC, the right. So you already you already knew how crazy he was from the rivalry, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of Stanford, so we were talking backstage. I got to get this out because you said you played against Michael Jordan back in your Stanford days. Tell tell us about playing against Michael Jordan. In my opinion. He's the greatest basketball player to ever live. People will say LeBron is, but he's the guy. Um, he, what, what do you? Wow, man, that must have been amazing. Right? No, it was different back then. Like today, you can play, you can pick a sport and play that sport pretty much twelve months out of the year. Back when we were growing up, uh, there was really only there was for me it was football, basketball, and baseball. Those were three seasons, and whatever season was, that was really the only sport you could compete in. Um, so I was, uh, you know, spending as much time playing football as I was basketball and baseball. Um, uh, they didn't have these club programs. There was no real AAU circuit back in the you know, early 80s, uh, late 70s. And uh, you'd have uh, these different camps. There's exclusive camps that you'd go to. Um, I didn't get to play against um, uh, Jordan in those camps, but I did get a chance to play against Jordan when I, my freshman year at Stanford, when uh, Carolina, uh, I forget what the connection was, but uh, our coach at the time at Stanford was uh, Dr. Tom Davis. He had some type of relationship with Dean Smith where he got uh, uh, the Tar Heels committed to come out to play at Maples Pavilion for the uh -huh. Apple Invitational Tournament. Maybe uh, Apple paid a lot of money to the Tar Heels to come out, but we had uh, Maples Pavilion sold out and um, I, I was playing uh, point guard. Uh, I was a good passer. And uh, I also was responsible to be the safety on defense. So if the shot went up, I had to like retreat so that they couldn't get a fast break up at the other end. So I retreated on this one play. They outlet it to uh, uh, Jordan on, on the left-hand side of the court facing the basket. And I'm back there like, oh, my God, here comes Michael Jordan. And I'm supposed to somehow <laughs> stop him. So I kind of like cheat over because he's running the runway, which is for the left block. And he just, he flew over my right shoulder <laughs> and just ducked on me. And he like came over. I mean, he didn't like go around me. He just came over my right shoulder and then ducked. Oh, so uh, and I didn't hurt my neck, but he definitely um, flew <laughs> past me. And John, yeah. and John is not a little guy either. Let me tell you. No. Tall guy. Yeah. How tall are you? Uh, I'm. I was back then it's probably like a tad under six three, but uh you know it is kind of amazing like some of those guys you think are taller than they really are. Oh, so man. uh and then back in those days you would uh um uh, you would little you would fudge on your, your height. And I don't no, think yeah. they're doing that quite as much, but I, I don't think I think Michael was a shade under six seven. I think he was yeah. listed six seven, but I think he was really more like six six. I think that's what he's listed six six. I remember reading it looking up yep. before, but that's incredible. I mean, to to be in that moment must have been just it's crazy. So the reason I bring up college too is the NFL draft is coming up as well. So uh, you were in that process as well. So the draft process is probably way different than it is, 
you know, back then I saw, I was reading, so they had a lot more rounds because I was looking mm -hmm. into your draft. Before yeah. So, um, right. So I was, uh, I came out of Stanford. I was battling a shoulder injury and it was a question of whether I would recover from my shoulder injury. I had, um, all kinds of problems with that. And then, um, you know, I spent a fair amount of time on the injured reserve, uh, with the 49ers, but I, I, you know, I did get drafted. I got drafted in the, at that time, which was the 10th round. Wow. And when I came to the 49ers, um, one of our players, uh, his nickname was Hercules, uh, and that was Dwight Clark. And the reason they called him Hercules is he was so – he was like the opposite of Hercules. Hercules is a big, strong <laughs> image person. And uh, Dwight was just long and angular. And we were like, oh, my God, there's Hercules kind of like trying to like make fun of the fact that he had no yeah. bulging um, muscles. But uh, he called me Jesse James. <laughs> And he first said, well, John, you're Jesse. So, like, when you're on uh, injury reserve, the idea was that, you know, I was stealing from the teams because I wasn't playing because I was hurt. So mm. he was stealing from the team. But he was like, oh, John, uh, no no ill will. Uh, I was also, also drafted in the 10th round. So tenth round, um, yeah. uh, they don't go that uh, long anymore. They only go uh, six rounds. And obviously it's turned into a big, huge media Day. I think it's, it's it's three days now. Is it three days? Three days, seven rounds, and then after that, all the undrafted players. So, yeah, ten rounds. That how many total was that? Ten total, or was eleven there, or twelve? I think. You know, I, I think they. Uh, I, I you know I don't know if it was ten total, so I don't know if I had a chance to be Mister Irrelevant or what, <laughs> yeah, but, really uh, irrelevant, right? Uh, yeah. uh, I, I think they had. You know, I think they kept reducing it. So I, I think. But I don't know what the history on that. I, I yeah. yeah, I yeah. wasn't Mr. Relevant. I mean, it's an awesome story about Brock Purdy. Uh, yeah. I do know I saw Brock at the uh, Stanford women's basketball um, uh, second round game when uh, Iowa State played Stanford and it went into overtime. Mm -hmm. And there was Brock uh, uh, down on the VIP section of the press row cheering on his um, Iowa State Cyclones. Uh, and uh, – uh, I mean, what a great story. And yeah. uh, just, uh, uh, you know, he beat out a guy that uh, was uh, paid to be the third string quarterback um, with a large uh, bonus. And for him to come in and, and do what he's done um, reminds me very much of, of Joe Montana. He just needs to, you know, go and win some Super Bowls now. Definitely. So you, you see some parallels and joe not just the story but do you see in his gameplay what, what's your overall take on on brock birdie and his gameplay and then you know this is the first off season where he can actually hone his craft because last year he was coming off of you know the the injury and then the, before he was a rookie so he's just trying to learn the ropes yeah i think what um something that may have been discounted before but i i, I think i've heard the nfl scouts are paying playing paying more um attention to guys that that play like um trey lance didn't get that many reps as, as a quarterback in college whereas I, I i think brock was like a four-year starter so he had all those reps because you, you can't replace real game situations in football because they want to protect the quarterback so whether it's college or pros in practice you don't hit the quarterback and let me tell you there's a big difference from throwing a football when you're not getting hit to when you are. So once you get in that game, and that's really, I mean, they don't really say it, but the best way to win a college or pro football game, and it's understood, is you take the quarterback out, you're done, or you, you had a great chance of winning. So you, when you get an opportunity to hit a quarterback, you hit him as hard as you can. And that you know, pays dividends for the defense. Like Ronnie Lott would be hit the dang quarterback. Uh, yeah. He doesn't throw the ball quite as well when he's like worried about getting hit. So um, with Brock playing all those reps, he's he's had to make quick decisions. He's had to uh, um, make plays, um, and I think that's has be become a bigger part now of evaluations for quarterbacks. Hey, did the guy play in college? Uh, is he, you've got to see how he on when live bullets are coming out. How does the guy perform versus just evaluating on his size, weight, height, 40 yard time, how far he can throw the ball. Um, and, and again, it kind of goes back to what I said about uh, winning the Super Bowl. You need a defense that can put pressure on the quarterback because you're, uh, you can't throw a pass when you're on your back. 
Yeah, it's a true statement. And, and you know, quarterback's supposed to be the big big position, right? Your leader, your captain, they they get the, the most of the money out of everybody. So you're right. If you take that guy, neutralize him, it's going to help your cause in winning the game. And um, I, I agree with you with in terms of scouting. I feel like those are intangibles that people may, you know, miss sometimes. These quarterbacks, they come out nowadays – and in one season, you, you don't really know it if they have a lot of seasoning. So I've noticed a lot of these quarterbacks, like Michael Penix, he played for several years. You know, these quarterbacks that were four or five years seniors, um, they're starting to get drafted and they have a little bit more success because, you know, they have a little bit more game situation and, and relevancy than some of these younger guys. But quarterbacks, definitely a polarizing position. You got a lot of quarterbacks like Caleb Williams, who's already touted to be the next big thing, but I feel like puts a lot of pressure on, on those guys. Quarterback's a tough spot, you know? I mean, if you kind of look at history, um, you know, with the 49ers uh, in the 80s with uh, a fourth-round draft pick taking us to four Super Bowls, uh, that was Joe Montana, and then uh, and then Brady, um, all the Super Bowls he went to, he was a sixth-round draft pick. So um, sometimes I think uh, – I'm a little secret. And then the Seahawks did so well there for a long time when they got Russell Wilson uh, as a fourth round draft pick. Uh, so you don't burn so much capital um, selecting a quarterback who, I mean, if you go through the stats, I would probably say, you know, at least maybe half the quarterbacks drafted in the first round in the last 20 years, half of them would be considered not reaching their expectations or failure or not, not yeah, failure, but, but they don't, they don't uh, progress to be what they're envisioned as a first string quarterback. Cause it's hard. Again, it's hard to uh, evaluate uh, quarterbacks um, on what they will do in the NFL with live bullets. Cause those guys right. are fast, strong. And, uh, and people don't understand too, is that, you know, when you're trying to throw a pass. It's hard to see downfield because you have these big guys waving their arms and you just get, split second vision of like who you're supposed to throw to when and where, what window. Um, now I, I'd say I've had arguments before, but I do think that you know, hitting the baseball is the most hardest thing to do in sports. And the second most hardest is uh, you know, being a quarterback playing in the NFL game. Yeah. But this tough. And, you know, like you said, you've got to make those quick decisions, but how important also is having a really good offensive line um, uh, in, in terms. So, because I know a lot of people right now, the draft's coming up. Niner fans want them to upgrade this offensive line. So maybe speak into that where offensive line come in, comes into play. And what was your kind of experience with the live bullets and having a, an O-line that was able to block you <laughs> in your experience? Well, I think um, you know, coming full circle, what I talked about at the very beginning, I just see I've got a red light here on my battery, so I might need to get a, a charger. But um, you know, I talked about uh, rushing the quarterback and um, – uh, uh, on how you know important that is, and you know, I, you know, like poor you know, Jim Plunkett, who I feel like should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He, you know, he came as a um, remember one quarterback coming out. I think he was the first guy picked, but then he just was beaten up. So there's a certain amount of like, don't bring like those first string, those first round guys get thrown into the fire too soon. I think at times, whereas Montana got to like wait, you know one, two, three years behind Montana and look and, and not have that much pressure on just like Brady kind of did the same thing um, because you can kind of lose confidence getting banged up and having, um, you know, some poor outings. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, you, you want, you want your quarterback and sometimes they're hard to come by. Um, and then, and then also there's a certain amount of luck too. Yeah, I think there's definitely luck, but I think you're right. Maybe having him go out there too soon and if he doesn't have success mentally, it could, you know, uh, mess a person up mentally. So uh, interesting. Ted, you got any takes or questions that you want to get off uh, before we – I know his time's a little – Well, yeah, I was, I was, I'm trying to, like, search here on my side for my charger. I can't find my charger, so my dang computer might turn off here any minute. But go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, I just wanted to know you, – you know, John, we had talked a little bit uh, off stage about a, a charity event you have coming up here in early May, May 2nd. Uh, it's called Inside Anne's Closet in honor of your uh, mother who passed away from colon cancer. And we'd love to learn a little bit more about the event 
and what to expect. Uh, yeah, real, real quickly, uh, my mom passed away in 2013. Uh, my sister and I, uh, we miss our mom. Uh, we, are, we are all going as a family to uh, the press conference that Kate, uh, my sister's having on Wednesday, uh, announcing her as the new Stanford women's basketball coach, replacing um, Tara Vanderbeer. Um, and uh, we've conducted a um, colon cancer awareness event called Inside Ann's Closet, which uh, is a celebrity fashion show on May 2nd, where we promote uh, screening for um, colon cancer. Um, and so we'd we'll love to see you there. Um, I think there's going to be a link here where you could buy tickets or donate money to it. Um, the link is in my description for the show, everybody. And then uh, Raj is going to add it after the show here. Cool, yep. cool. So in any case, that event is, is a lot of fun. Uh, some of my former teammates are going to be there. We'll have some current uh, uh, Stanford football players and other Stanford nice. athletes, including players from my uh, sister's team uh, at Stanford. But, you know, um, I, I'm a football guy through and through. Um, I do know that, uh, you know, I talked about a little bit earlier, like uh, rushing the quarterback on offense. Um, you know, the key on offense uh, – it starts with the running game. That's what we have with uh, the 49ers new offense. We've got two running backs. We've got a great, uh, great halfback, uh, a great fullback. And, you know, really, um, you know, that was kind of the key uh, to our offense was uh, when I was with the 49ers, we had Coach McKittrick, who was our offensive line coach. And uh, I know uh, Coach Walsh, I'd always be standing next to Coach Walsh during games, and he'd be on the headsets, and he'd be like, Bob, 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 I need a run play. What's the what's run play? And then Bob was kind of in charge of running the – uh, like giving suggestions for the run plays. And then there was upstairs with Holmgren and, and Denny Green giving uh, uh, suggestions for the pass play. But uh, if you think about the pass or the offense being two, two, uh, three phase, uh, pass, passing, passing plays, running plays, and then play pass. And really that was so important was set, uh, having the successful run play that Coach McKittrick would draw up and then fake the run play and throw the pass uh, – is uh, th those three components? I think you really need to have all together to be a um, a, a good offense. Very good. Yeah, we got a comment from Invader Ford Nunner. He says you can't talk about Bill Walsh without talking about. Bill. Oh yeah, I see so, that yeah. right there. That's uh, you, you, said you hit it right yes, on the head. Yeah. See that. Oh. you hit it right on the head. You're right. Oh god, how did so, I manage that? Look at that. This guy, he knows it all, man. And, and it's crazy when you mention all those coaches, like that coaching tree. That's fantastic. I, I just going through them when you said Holmgren and Danny Green and oh my God. Right. What I is that? Say before I get a chance, as I said, I'm looking at my little red thing. I think I have enough yeah. time, but if I don't, I've had a great time on this um, uh, podcast. I'd love to do it again. Uh, go for the Niners. Um, there's what I kind of tease people about is there's uh, there's foot there in sports or maybe just in life, there's football and then there's everything else. So uh, <laughs> I tease my sister. I mean, yes, you know. Women's basketball is as important as men's basketball and more popular this year, maybe in some cases than uh, the NCAA men's side. But uh, yes, there's football and then there's everything else. Yeah, it's true. You know, you got to That's the thing, because fans get so hung up. But you got to remember, there's a life after football. But um, appreciate you for taking time and coming on and blessing, right, you with, uh, blessing us with some stories and everything and your insight. It's awesome to to hear all the insight. Now, do you guys have this like on? If I wanted to look at it later, is there a place? Is there a library? Yeah, I'll send you a link for YouTube, John. Yeah, okay. we're live now, and then it'll it'll be, you can watch the recording anytime. And then uh, for those who don't know, though, just uh, real quick, just to make sure that people understand, the reference to Kate, John's sister, is that she was the assistant. She played for Tara Vanderbeer, won a championship in '91 for Stanford, then was the assistant head coach for Stanford, and now Tara Vanderbeer stepping aside. And John Pace's sister, Kate, who went to Stanford, played for Stanford, is now succeeding Tara Vanderbeer, her coach there, a uh, legend uh, in women's basketball at Stanford. So so John's parents went there to Stanford. His sister went there. He went there. It's a family affair with Stanford. And, and like he said, he's never left six miles. Away. Great. My, yeah, my years. sister's a great athlete. And then one thing that I got to experience this year that she didn't get to participate in was uh, uh, Steve Young and I were able to coach high school girls flag football this year and oh, my wow. sister uh would have been a great uh flag football player quarterback she had an arm she she could throw <laughs> and, and uh, she was good enough that i would be able to throw when i was playing uh a lot of times we'd go down to the basketball gym do a little bit of basketball where i coached her 
um, at high in high school at Menlo, but I would throw passes and I'd be my ball, but pss, and she'd catch every one and throw it right back. Uh, so that's but, awesome. But Kate has, I saw her yesterday, and I'll just, for the record, Kate has never beaten me in ping pong, ever. <laughs> okay. You heard it here for us first. first. Undefeated. Hey, quick, one other quick question for you, John. Is that press conference open to the public at all? Can anybody go? Uh, I, I know it's at Kissick, um, Kissick Center, which is there in the regular athletic department at 3.30. So. Uh, okay. I would say I say more the merrier. I always liked uh, small gyms with a lot of people rather than big gyms. With a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. All right. well, thanks a lot, John. I appreciate it. Right. And thank you uh, guys. You're doing a great job. Thanks for your support of the 49ers. Of course. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. Appreciate thanks. you. All right. Good stuff, man. Good guests. I'm glad you uh, got them on there, Ted. Um, that, that was very fun to talk about some stuff from yesteryear. And, uh, you know, the 49ers and, and get to hear a little bit of how it was back then till now. Like, I just can't imagine growing, you know, I mean, I watched it when I was younger football, but just being in the sport back then, there was no social media. It was just, yeah. is you play football. There was no internet. Contact. Yeah, there's no internet. <laughs> Nobody knew what the hell was going on. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It was like fax machines and rotary phones. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I didn't even know fax machines in the 70s. I mean, yeah. It so huh? It's crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was crazy that we met at a party and. He's like, when I played for the team, I'm like, well, who are you? And he's like, John Pay. I was like, oh, damn. Oh, I was wow, like, I used to cool. watch you at Stanford, and I knew he played yeah. for the Niners, and I was starstruck. But we, all, we had a lot of good conversations during the Super Bowl, and I was happy to continue it on a live stream. And like you said, you'd like to come back. I would love to have oh, him we'll, we'll get him on. We'll ask. Hope I want to pick his brain more. Yeah, Talk hopefully we can figure out how to uh, promote his uh, real estate business a little bit for him, too. And Absolutely. Hopefully, get him some dollars thrown his way. And make it worth the let's, let's get that bag for him, baby. Let's throw the bag to him. We'll Never hurts, him right? Never, Never hurts. hurts. And we get to pick his mind. I want to hear more about Steve Young, you know? So uh, it was good stuff. Uh, but appreciate everybody in the chat listening along. So we got a little bit more time. I, I feel like we could spend another 10 minutes here talking about. So the 49ers, they went back. Their off-season program started today. I've been trying to figure out what's going on, trying to figure out if there's any reports on it, I haven't really seen anything other than, you know, it's their phase two program. They are just there. The coaches are going to be doing, you know, some, some film, some meetings, some interviews and stuff like that. Nothing too crazy. They're not doing any scrimmage, you know, OTAs next month and um, rookie camp next month as well. So it's just the preliminary stages. My biggest concern is, is Brandon, are you going to be there? And if he's not, what does that mean for the team? Cause Justin Jefferson didn't report to his, you know, uh, uh, team to the Vikings today, but they're voluntary. So they don't have to go. These players don't have to go. So if Brandon I doesn't show up, it's not the end of the world. And he did post a picture on his Instagram story that says day one vibes, but I don't know if that means day one, like he's going there, but I, I didn't want to speculate. So I didn't post it. Saw someone post it. And I was like, I don't know if it really means he's going to camp or not. I'll wait for an official word, but what's your overall, I know we talked about it a little bit, but I figured we'd talk about it. What's your overall feeling about the Brandon Ayuk situation? I mean, I, I won't be surprised if he misses all the optional uh, events. Okay. Um, you know, he doesn't want to get hurt. And, yeah. Uh, that's a smart move. Uh, I agree. You know, I think he needs to do what he needs to do. I'll never begrudge anybody for getting top dollar in a sport where their, you know, current and future livelihood is at risk every single time they step on the field. So. Do what you need to do to get your bag, Brandon, and uh, you know all will be forgiven once you sign. <laughs> I agree with that. I think it is what it is. It's business is business. The Niners are going to do what they're going to do. Brandon Ike's got to do what he's got to do. Um, big news today in the world of wide receivers: Devonta Smith signed a contract extension, and I think this is a, a year, right? Yeah, fifty million guaranteed. Yeah, fifty fifty mil guaranteed, and I think this is a contract that sets the table for the Brandon Ayuk money, the contract, because he gets, what, 25 a year? I think Ayuk is slightly better than Devonta Smith. He also has an all-pro selection. Smith doesn't have a Pro Bowl or an all-pro, which might have been, you know, um, might have been unfortunate. Like, he probably deserved it at some point. You know, he, sometimes these players, they get snubbed. But regardless, Brandon Ayuk has an all-pro selection, back-to-back 1,000-yard -back, receiving years. And I think he should be paid just a slightly 
bit higher than Devonta Smith, maybe 25.5 a year, maybe 52 million guaranteed instead of 50. So that's where I think the framework's got to start. And then you have to ask yourself, will Brandon Ayuk be paid the same as Devonta or more? Or, you know, that's where the Niners and Ayuk have to start. That's the number. I think that's the number. I'm going to take the counterpoint here, uh, which is unusual. Usually we're pretty lockstep, Raj. Uh And I'm just going to say, I think Ayuk might be the better receiver, um, especially like per play. I think it's hard to argue that he's not, especially, you know, since uh, he had the second best yards per catch last season in the entire NFL. That's pretty good. Um, But I am going to say that Devontae Smith is a true wide receiver too. Okay. A A true two. A true two, yeah. You don't I mean, think Devonta could go to another team and be a dub one wide receiver one? Oh, he could be, yeah, on certain teams, certainly. I mean, especially some of the poor receiving teams, uh, absolutely, like, say, the Carolina Panthers or something. Yeah, and, and Ayuk could go and be a wide receiver one on one of those. Well, teams. that's where I'm not as sure. Okay, I mean, okay, that's where I'm I'm getting. not – I think he could, I think, but I'm just not sure that Ayuk could – or as sure. Just because, let's face it, he was kind of our fourth option on our team – when you got Debo, you got Kittle, you got CMC, all kind of ahead of him in the pecking order. Uh, at least when push comes to shove, right? I mean, there were some easy games or easy opponents where he racked up a lot of yards, but in the tough, tough situations, I think the other three are ahead of him. And so it just makes me wonder a little bit if he's better. Um, so I, I think I will get more, maybe not because he's better, but just because he signs later. And I think just. Whoever goes, this is that game. Whoever signs last gets the most. Yeah. So I think he, he, he may get more, but I'm not really ready to say he's better than Devontae Smith. It's just close. Yet. It's, just it's close. Devontae's a that. really good receiver, and I'm not yeah. taking anything away from Ayuk. But to your point, to your credit on that, and I think the 49ers could absolutely use that as a leverage point is saying, hey, you know what? You were the fourth option. But I, you can say, hey, yeah, it was fourth option and it had 17.2 yards. Like he, he, There's all leverage in it. But the 49ers can say, you take away Debo, you take away Kittle, you take away CMC, would you be at the statistical point that you are? And, that, and that's, that's how you get a lot more it. attention from a lot better yeah. defenders. It's yeah. just hard to say, you know. Yeah. So, it's just hard to say. Yeah, He's such a tough. great route runner. It leads me to believe that he would – still do really well, but, you know, how much of a drop-off would there be? I think at least a little. A little bit, yeah. You'd have to understand, like, people would be double-teaming, triple-teaming him um, a lot more than he is. And I'm not saying that he wouldn't be able to handle it. He might be able to. His route running is great. But at the same time, there is that conversation that the 49ers are going to – it's a contract negotiation. They're going to throw that out there. Um, But at least the one thing we can assure of is he hasn't – requested a trade yet maybe it will come because if we're talking about how this is copy paste Debo Samuel it's gonna happen because Debo Samuel did the same thing and the trade request came but man I that was so great yesterday because I wake up and I see all these reports oh my god requested a trade and I'm waking up oh god crushed them I'm like what Debo Brandon I and I see the source and I'm like what who? is this who? 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 somebody and like yeah. the way he wrote it we were live yesterday talking about the way he wrote it and like at the end, he's like, "Wow, hold on to your seats." Like you don't, if you have a sourced report, like Ian Rappaport's not, but wow, hold on to your seats, guy, please. It's silly. And then boom, the agent quote tweets it, and then just, "Wow, well, get check your sources, buddy." That was fantastic to me. That was fantastic. It is the one other thing I would say about Brandon Ayuk is that uh, you know he's obviously got better hands than Debo, who has better hands than Jennings. Um, but does he have as good a hands as Devontae Smith? Like, I don't know. I, mm. I, I feel like Ayuk has good hands, but he's not like an elite pass catcher. Um, so so that would be my other knock against him. Oh, because he has but I love his drop. blocking. I love his route running. Um, love his long arms. There's a lot to like. I mean, I love There's his personality. I love the Applebee's thing you that you posted was great. I love that was undercover, so good, man. Undercover <laughs> athlete, it was great. Also, yes, since yes. since last week, uh, did we sign Rocky Asim before we went live last week, or has that happened since? I feel like that was since that we. Had I talked. think it happened after. Yeah, we got Rocky yeah. Sin. Uh, real quick, before we get to Rocky Sin, I wanted to address this question, um, yeah. but from Invader Forty Nine er, he says, "How interesting was the pick of Forster and Lynch and Coach Fisk uh, at Washington?" Coach Fisk having coached Jordan uh, Morgan, OT Arizona. So if you guys didn't see this weekend, um, John Lynch 
and Chris Forster, offensive line coach, were in Washington for the Washington in Seattle, Washington for the University of Washington Pro Day. And there's a lot of scout. There's a lot of great talent on Washington. They've been a good team for a couple of years now. And the most interesting thing was that they stayed after. They stayed after practice after the pro day, um, and they looked at Roger Rosengarten um, during warmups. So this is a big offensive tackle. He was the fastest offensive tackle. He ran a four point nine two forty. It's freaking insane. So they looked at him. They they scouted him very slow, very closely. And um, the other thing about it is Joe Staley, yeah, 49ers legend, mentored this guy and also did some work with him um, last year. So it kind of – this might be their guy at 31. Hey, and he doesn't pass block well. He's a perfect fit, right? But if they take him – Shanahan dream. I mean, he's so good on his feet. He's so quick, and the Niners love that zone scheme. They could run the ball behind him. Would he be an upgrade over Colton McKivitz? What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind. I'd uh, love to have him. Sounds like he's more of a second-round guy, but we might reach a little just to get the fifth year. Of but, but at 31, yeah. he's Yeah, that's practically he's, a, that's that's just a second glorified round. second-round pick anyway. And, and let me clarify. Actually, Joey from 49ers Hive says it was a spring game. It wasn't um, – the pro day. So sorry about that. It was spring game, but uh, that's, that's it. Rose, Rose, I wouldn't mind it. I, we need to upgrade. We need a young tackle. Like you said, you get a young guy in the first round, you can give him the fifth year option. You get a little bit more leeway with the four, you know, with the rookie like that. It's an upgrade. And then you could have Colton. He could be your swing tackle. And I would be a fantastic move for the 49ers, but um, we'll see. It's still early. Maybe it's a smoke screen. It is a huge reach says golden dragon. That's what you said. It is a reach. You think, Sometimes you got to reach a little. Well, you know, the Niners are never going to pick BPA, folks. So get that out of your heads. That's the thing. They get the guys that they they're gonna like. Be, they they're going to reach them. for need every time. So as long as you understand that, then you're like, okay, you know, do, here we go again. Here we go again. <laughs> you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. When they make their draft picks, you're either going to love them or you're going to hate them. And then there's that pick is going to be a polarizing pick because it's the first – First round pick they've had in what three years? Since um, yeah, since Trey Lance, they got to hit this shit. Yeah, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. There's some got to exercise the demons. Yeah, that was. Yeah, it's not just yeah. Trey Lance too, folks. I mean, come on, it's it's. I mean, then you're after you got Bosa. Okay, yeah, Bosa. But you know that one was we're not giving. I mean, that's like, giving. You missed on. Then your yeah. next best first round pick is McGlinchey. And like, Actually, oh. no, it's Brandon Ayuk. Oh, yeah. Ayuk. Sorry, sorry. All right, we traded up. They the traded up. For, for they, so they, they traded up to get Kinlaw, and then they traded up to get Ayuk. Traded back for Kinlaw, yeah. Instead yeah. of taking worse. Ah. Oh, but yeah, I mean, Ruben Foster, <laughs> Can you imagine Thomas. Yeah, there's some. There's some. Uh, Oh. Ugly picks in there in the first. So, oh. yeah, I, I I I would love to have an offensive tackle as our pick, as, as long as it's not a huge, huge reach. But, you know, if, if he's the guy, like you said, you got Staley working with him. Um, you know, University of Washington where he played was big uh, outside zone run scheme. So mm -hmm. he's had four years of it. So. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's a scheme fit, like you said, fast, athletic, and, uh, maybe he'll grow into the role. I don't know. I, I just don't see him ever taking over for, uh, um, Trent, Trent Williams. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's not the Trent Williams replacement. That's, that's some big that's shoes. That's the Colton throw. McKivitz replacement where you can yeah. keep Colton and make Colton the swing tackle, swing tackle, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Your I love Colton as a swing great. tackle. He's, oh, Absolutely. Highly qualified as a swing tackle. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. As usual. So we'll see how it goes. But uh yeah, at, at some point, yeah, the Trent Williams situation is gonna that's that's later down the line. You're gonna have to you're you can't replace him with a with the draft pick. I think I think maybe you gotta get Tristan Worth <laughs> to replace. Oh man. <laughs> oh man, that's there you go. Atone for your sins. Yeah, I know. Come on, man. Oh man. But yeah, so then 
let's shift gears. Let's talk about one thing that did happen last week uh, that we didn't get to talk about because after we spoke last Monday, we got a little bit of news. Iraq Yassin, 49ers, uh, added a veteran cornerback. Uh, he used to, he was drafted by the Colts. He played for the Ravens and the Raiders. Pretty hard-hitting physical corner. He's not like this elite game changer, but he's a nice veteran. And Solid. now they got they got some depth that corner. They got obviously Rocky Sin. They got Isaac Yadam. They signed Chase Lucas. You got um, you know Mooney Ward. You got Diamond Lenore. And then they also got um, the rookie from last year, Luter, and then Sam Womack. So they got some depth there. And then of course everybody's favorite, Embry Thomas. What's your take <laughs> on bringing in Rocky Sin? I mean, I think uh, for everybody who was talking about how great Yadam could be, I think that, that's your answer right there of what they think of him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> much. But, you know, I remember when, I was, when we were looking at the lists of uh, available corners, he was like the next name I was going to read off that I, I was like, hey, I wouldn't mind a solid guy like him. So I'm, I'm happy about Rocky Sin. I would have been happier if it was uh, uh, the guy I mentioned, but now I'm blanking on his name. Uh, a Dory Jackson. Remember we talked about yeah, JC yeah, yeah. Jackson. I said, no, that's not the right Jackson. I think we want a Dory Jackson. That probably would make me happier, but I, I like Rocky Sin. I think we've probably got a good deal, one year deal. And, uh, and uh, it's just more depth. I, I wouldn't call him a camp body though. I think he has a real good shot at making a uh, starting roster, at least yeah. until maybe Luter or someone we draft this year gets up to speed. I agree. Uh, again, you got to get, a veteran in there so then maybe those other guys can start developing a little bit more because they're uh womack and looter got hurt last year they kind of redshirted in a, in a sense right so need them to get up to speed but you got a guy that could come in and right start and also it gives them a little bit more versatility because now you can move rocky sin outside you get a mooney ward he's going to play outside anyways and then you can drop diameter lornor in the slot so he could play outside or inside but if rocky sin can play very good on the outside then you can move. You can afford to move Lenore on the inside, and you got a pretty damn good secondary with Mooney Ward, Lenore, and Rocky Sin. So that was a good move uh, overall. And watching the film from Rocky Sin in the NFL, that guy's a physical guy. I remember him coming out of the draft actually, and I scouted this guy, and I was looking. I was, I, I liked him because I remember Senior Bowl. There was some film. I think we posted it where he went one on one with Debo Samuel in the Senior Bowl, and he just saw how gritty these two were going up. So the guy's a very physical corner. And that's what the 49ers like. They like guys that can punch you in the mouth at cornerback. So, Absolutely, like yeah. On the offense, we say <clears throat> no block, no rock. And on the defense, you could say no run fit. You might as well quit, you know. Oh, and, I like it. Ooh, yeah. So you there you go. Got to stop that run first, the NFL. Make them pass. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I like it. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's see. Let me take a look at any other news that we may have missed from the week. Um, obviously, we saw that. Brandon Ayuk unfollowed the 49ers. Oh, my God. But, um, you know, the agent shoots down the news. So that was – we talked about that. Brock Purdy did another commercial last week. He did an ad for um, John Deere. This man's collecting the oh, – with, with his buddy Colton McKibbins. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, he's not going anywhere. So he's getting the Infinity Stones of commercials, man. This guy's getting a lot of endorsements. They love to see it. And, um, yeah, so Rocky Sin, they, they made that happen. Logan Ryan retired. I think that happened the day after we spoke. Um, so, yeah, they, they were probably still looking for a veteran safety. They did a tryout for Kellen Mond, but he got signed by the Saints. So forty nine, he could thank the 49ers, maybe send him a Christmas card for putting his uh, name out there. And other than that, I think the last thing that kind of has some relevancy, um, the, the NFL released – a revised uniform policy to allow a team to wear a third helmet design and everybody's been posting different helmet concepts. You excited about that? Another, maybe a gold Chrome or. All yeah. That, yeah. That, that shiny gold looks pretty cool to me for sure. Looks good. Looks good. Yeah. Other than that, that's the news for the week, my man, anything going on with you? Tell the Niner fans um, what's going on with you. Uh, you know, Tuesdays I've got uh, Ryan uh, from no border sports. We do no BS Ted. I think we're doing 11.40 a.m. or now that he got a new computer, it doesn't take 10 minutes for it to warm up. Uh, mm -hmm. We might be even doing 11.30 on Tuesdays. Uh, but other than that, um, I'll have to talk to Big Mike from the Man Cave about uh, Faithful Dogs. He's been getting some OT at work. 
And uh, I'm like, hey, man, go get paid. That's fine. Real life first, I always say with this stuff. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I, I've been pretty slow on setting other stuff up. I've been just taking a lot of time to bike with my son and stuff. Uh, we uh, Our home pump track at uh, Flood Park in Menlo Park was closed. And so we did three different pump tracks last week. We did uh, one up in uh, El Granada, which is just north of Half Moon Bay, called Quarry. One down closer to you in San Jose, West San Jose, called Calabazas. Mm. And those were both dirt tracks. And then uh, over the weekend, we were down in Carmel, Monterey area. And we Just north of Monterey, there's a town called Seaside. And there's Marina. Marina has this huge pump track. And we went there Saturday. That stopped raining for a few hours on Saturday. We got out. So we've, we've been, 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 been living the life, the bike life, right? Let's go. Pump Let's track, go. Bay Area tour, and, and Monterey yeah. Bay Area tour. Nice. Yeah, That's nice stuff. But it's good. I'm getting in shape too. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm definitely. Yeah, when you, when I see you next time, you're gonna be fucking lost like some weight, gain some muscle. So good yeah, stuff, it's man. Going well. Good it's stuff. Well. Good to good to hear. Good to see. I love to hear it. Um, that's well, that was the thing much. I was gonna say too about you know people. You know, we were talking about Brandon Ayuk and like all, everybody's concentrating on Brandon Ayuk, and it's like well, partly because like last year there was so much more to talk about. We had, you know, in March we had the the surgery for Brock Purdy for his UCL. And then there was the Trey Lance and Brock Purdy, you know, uh, you know, potential. Yeah, the, it's been a relatively quiet off season. Quarterback controversy. Is, kind of nice. Know. No controversy. So people yeah. are trying to figure out what the hell we going to talk about. So they yeah, up so the people are hyper-focusing on any little tidbit. Like right a little now. story. Oh, my God. Brock Purdy sneezed. Oh, my God. Like, it's just yeah. weird. It's, nothing really going on. I guess on. he like, did that camp for kids, too, right? The quarterback Yeah, he did camp. his camp for kids. His first NFL youth camp. Um, I think it's the first quarterback. I think Cam Inman posted yesterday. First quarterback for the 49ers since Colin Kaepernick to do a youth camp. It's been a minute since a quarterback has actually done one of these for the 49ers. So, uh, as pretty cool, man. Not, as long as it's not cars for kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For bananas. <laughs> My son even knows. He's like, oh, daddy hates that commercial. I'm like, no, son. <laughs> Strongly <laughs> dislike it. Hate, hate yeah. is a strong word. I strongly dislike it. So. Oh man, you're right. A uh, couple quick tidbits here before we end it. So there was a couple of news things I didn't talk about. So the 49ers, former 49ers offensive lineman Lakin Tomlinson is now officially an op. He went to the Seahawks last week. Yes, um, that's that's uh, addition, subtraction by addition, right there. Yeah, because we all know he couldn't pass block when he was here. And I guarantee it's only gotten worse. I remember hearing stories on the Jets. That's why a lot of people wanted to go back. I didn't want him. He's oh, watching. I never man. wanted him back. No. Now not I can over, see Nick Bosa. Aaron now Bryant. I see. Now I want to see uh, Javon Hargrave and Nick Bosa lit this man up, rip him apart. Oh yeah, Gino. Gino's gonna be running for his life. Yeah, he is. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. And um, today, the 49ers, uh, apparently, they scheduled a top 30 visit with the Iowa tight end Eric All. He's a former, actually, Michigan, transferred to Iowa. Iowa, we all know George Kittle went to Iowa. And Niners have been Parkinson, uh, Sam George LaPorta. Fant, no Fant, Fant right? No yeah. Fant. yeah, he's not quite in that in that echelon, but he's he's pretty close. He's, he's, he's damn good. solid tight end. I kind of wanted him this offseason, no Fant. Yeah, so uh, Eric All, if, if Kittle has anything to do with the draft, Maybe they'll draft this guy. This is the 49ers really are looking for another tight end. They they really are. So that's good. What I good because so they, we need that second blocking catching tight end to unlock Kyle's system. Yeah, because the tight ends they drafted last year so far haven't been too hot. So key, key to Rebecca, as they say. That's right. Um, any last minute comments, questions, or anything like that? Any predictions coming in? We got next week live, me and you. It'll be um, the the week before the draft, the officially the week before the draft. So we'll do maybe like a a mock draft, or we'll we'll do some mock picks or something. I'll, br- I'll brush up a little bit. I have been keep procrastinating. Yeah, same here. That's so good. I'll, I'll I can put my foot in the dirt on that one. Like, Got to do it for Raj, baby. There you go. I'll spend some time on uh on on figuring out some. You know, I mean, I've been keeping up a little bit, but not like I used. I used to go like head all into the the draft, man, but. Now I'm just not as focused as I used to be because I'm working a lot. But we'll try that next week and um, have a good one, my man. It was good talking to you today. Appreciate John Pay for stopping by. When you get a chance to see him uh, or talk to him, Ted, just let him know. I said thank you 
uh, for your time. That was a pr very uh, nice of him to stop by. We got some good insight from the old days of the NFL and the 49ers. So you guys have a good rest of your day. Go Niners. Bang, bang. Nine again. Peace. Go Niners. Late.